Right. Oh. And we are recording. Yes. Hey, hey, everyone. I am Richard Woloski, and I want to welcome you to All Up with J.W. Rinsler here at Force Fest celebrating the saga. Oh, uh, and, and I am Sarah Woloski. And now, everyone, before we get started, we wanted to remind everyone that Force Fest is raising money for Make a Wish Greater LA, and your donation will directly fund wishes for critically ill children. This is super important. We partnered on a local level so that it would directly fund some wishes, and you can donate to the link in the chat that Chase just posted, or Get Vocal will match 33% of all donations made through Get Vocal VCoin right here. So if you happen to be watching, and you see this blue diamond with a V in it, that's how you purchase VCoin, and you can just contribute to any stage on Force Fest, and that will be an extra 33% of whatever you donate. It's super exciting. And thank you in advance. Yeah. All right, now, uh, many of you know Mr. Rinsler's best-selling work, especially if you are a fan of what goes on behind the scenes of your favorite films like the Indiana Jones saga, Alien, Planet of the Apes, and of course, the numerous Star Wars films and the Star Wars saga. All right, and J.W. Rinsler's first historical fiction thriller, All Up, about the space race is on sale now. And coming soon is a memoir about Howard Kazanjian, Return of the Jedi and Raiders of the Lost Ark producer. We're super excited about this. Hey, hey, J.W. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Well, thanks so much for joining us on, on Force Fest. So let's let's go back uh, a couple of years here, or decades, and let's start with you working at Lucasfilm. And you wanted in so much that your first attempt was to apply as a as a matte painter. And then after that, you went to Pixar, hoping, okay, is there a door open over there? Then finally, on that fateful day of, was it September 11th, 9-11? You got the call to work at Lucasfilm as a, as a non-fiction editor, then as Lucasfilm's ex, uh, creative executive. So what, what does that job entail? It sounds like it's on par with George Lucas's job. Hardly. Uh, well, you know, I, when I started, you know, I just started as, as a, even though I was hired as a non-fiction editor, it was really a fair amount of fiction too. I was doing the Scholastic uh, Boba Fett novels and a whole bunch of Jude Watson YA novels. So really it was both. But um, then, it, it, and then the job changed as, as I got to know George Lucas and I sort of became his unofficial editor-in-chief or publisher, producer, whatever. He would tell me what books he wanted to do and then I'd have to go out and you know, help make a deal with the publisher and, and then sort of <laughs> produce it with George, essentially. So then it, that's when the job changed into more what i guess if you say creative executive or executive editor or whatever is yeah so george lucas was giving you homework assignments uh basically yeah i mean <laughs> we were day work, uh, afternoon work and the occasional uh yeah homework it was wow. very intense you always had to be on call because not that he did it that often but you know you never knew when you get a call from jane bay because George you know, suddenly thought of something and it changes one of the books that we're working on. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's nerve wracking, but, but you know, it was really interesting work. So yeah. then, then George and Jane Bay, his assistant, had your secret beeper number? Well, it wasn't secret, yeah, but they had her, she had my mobile number. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then, then yeah, so sometimes I'd be sitting there, this only happened a couple of times because. He yeah. didn't know how much work a single human could do, but one time I was sitting there and he turned to me and he gave me the idea for five books. It was and it was about nine years work. Whoa. <laughs> oh my gosh. Now this, we're this job security. Was that the making of books by any chance? Or is this something no, else? Those were those were the uh, Star Wars art series. Oh and comics and and the first one took five years. Then we got faster than it was six, seven, eight, nine. It was about nine years work, more or less. Now, most people know of your work from those really fantastic making of books from the original trilogy. 
Now, is it difficult to make a making of book for a film after it had come out where now you have to track down cast and crew members and cross-reference their stories, as opposed to Revenge of the Sith, where you were there during the making of the film? Well, there's like apples and oranges. You know, what, Revenge of the Sith was actually a lot harder in terms of, you know, time versus page number, number of pages, because I'd be just a fly on the wall and I couldn't control, I'd be there for three hours sometimes and I'd get about two sentences for the book. Sometimes nothing, you know, because nothing interesting happened really. And so, but when you do an archive book, then you go in and I was fortunate for the Star Wars books, particularly for the first two, because there were all these archival interviews that I was able to, to use that hadn't been used before for any book. I mean, it was just very lucky. Did you have to cross-reference a lot of stuff? Meaning where if you heard uh, or saw an interview from one person or heard a tape from another person and information just wasn't lining up, was there a lot of that where you had to fact check? Um, a lot of the facts? That didn't happen too many times. I mean, in a way, the ultimate fact checker was George. He would read the manuscript. <laughs> he didn't change anything, but if there was something that was just wrong, he would point it out. It didn't happen that many. Because I, I was lucky, too, that I had actual production reports and ILM camera reports and conference notes and script drafts. So in terms of what people remember, there was only a few instances where people had different versions of what maybe was happening. Uh, and in those cases, you know, because it's not, it's not a trial. It's not, nobody's on trial. <laughs> you don't know Star Wars fandom <laughs> the way we do. <laughs> but, um, you know, you don't have, it's a, we would do, put the, we would put the contrasting stories next to each other. And people could decide for themselves. George didn't care if somebody disagreed with him necessarily, as long as his point of view was also expressed. All right. Yeah, I've, through doing my own research, I often find so many conflicting stories. Then I just go to one of your making of books and like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much the deciding factor right there. Yeah. I hope, yeah. I hope so. Or <laughs> not, not for all things, I'm sure. But anyway. Uh, what am I, what's that? I'm glad it's useful. Oh, oh, very, very much so. They were right in arm's reach in my office. Now, one of my favorite books as a kid was Alan Arnold's Once Upon a Galaxy, The Making of the Empire Strikes Back in 1980. Then in, in 1983, there was also another Making of Return of the Jedi book. Were those useful in writing your books? Yeah, and in, in both cases, uh, for Empire Strikes Back, I was really lucky that somehow Don Bees had rescued the original cassettes from, you know, from 1979, from a, the garbage they were being thrown out in the archives. I'm not sure why, maybe a mistake. Anyway, he, he took them home and put them in a closet. And when he heard that I was doing the Empire book, he said, you know, I have, the, I have Alan Arnold's original tapes. Would that be of interest to you? <laughs> so it was great. I was able to listen to the tapes because I had a, a car, um, with an old tape player in it, because I had an old car. And so, and then and then we had the tapes transcribed. So, and I realized that he used maybe 15% tops of these interviews. Oh, in wow. Because it was a very short book, really. Yeah. And, uh, so he, he would do 20 pages long interviews sometimes, and only about a page and a half had been used already. So each time it was, it was great. And for the, for the, for Return of the Jedi, they, they only did two actual long-form interviews, but those were hadn't been used much at all. And that was Howard Kazanjian and Richard Marquand. And of course, Richard Marquand, that was the that was like finding the the Ark of the Covenant for that book. <laughs> it was this hundred page long interview, practically none of which had made it into the actual Return of the Jedi, the original little paperback book. Wow, that's so it just, exciting. It was just stuffed in the side of one of the production boxes. It was just really fortunate. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, okay, so these making of books, you know, I'm so intrigued by all the research you must do. And like, where do you even start with your research? What's, what's your process? 
uh, for those Star Wars books, the, the process was first getting a hold of all the different scripts, and then and, and doing all and doing all the research and production files, try and get the daily progress reports. So basically, you want to create a chronological skeleton of what happened when. So I kind of do that, and at the same time, start going through the interviews, and then you know you just. You just really have to go through those interviews with a fine tooth comb because sometimes in the same paragraph, they can talk about three different things that happen in three different parts of production. And that's why in a lot of books, you'll just see the raw interview because nobody wants to take that interview and take it apart. It takes a long time, but I love doing it. So I take apart all the different interviews and put them into the chronological timeline. And then the book, once you do that, then you can kind of start writing the book. How long did the making of Star Wars take you? It came out in 2007. When did you start writing that one? I think I started probably in 2005. So it, I think I had about a year and a half, more or less. But that's not full time, right? This is, I have my day job, which is working as an editor. So that's morning, nights, and weekends for you know, roughly 14, 15 months. I don't remember exactly. So once we, once that was done and put out and, and they saw the Del Rey saw how successful it was, did you immediately start on The Empire Strikes Back? Yeah, because making the Star Wars um, hit the New York Times bestseller list for I think just one week. It, it, you know, it was an expensive book, but for an expensive book to make it onto the list was pretty good. So yeah, so then the Empire was greenlit and George also had to, you know, greenlit it. And the same thing, I mean, then it sold well enough for the next one, Return of the Jedi, which is nice because it's nice to have done all three of them. It would have been kind of too bad to have two out of three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was there ever any point, like, you know, you find all this information about these making of books and you're putting it all in order. Was there ever a time that Lucasfilm, like, wouldn't let you put some kind of information into a making of book? Can you give us a scoop? No, I mean, yeah. It, it was, you know, it, it really was a mom and pop company when George Lucas owned it. And there were rules and then there were other rules and some of those rules trumped some of the other rules. But it, since I was working directly with George, if George okayed the manuscript, that was it. <laughs> the, the legal department would also look at it, but the, the movie took place 30 years ago, you know, or filmed 30 years ago. And, uh, you know, the, the PR department would look at, they never changed a word. Um, wow. If, if George was looking at it, that was it. It's his company, <laughs> he approves it, we're done here. <laughs> he, he is the story group. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, and I showed him, you know, once the book was laid out, I showed it to him again. You know, and, and there was, you know, I didn't go out of my way to put something super controversial in it. There are, there are, it, in the in the so-called closet are always stories that people are going to tell you, and you know that's just not going to be in the book because it's personal. It really doesn't have anything to do with the making of the film. Now there are special editions of these books, the e-books, that have rare audio uh, attachments to them. Is there any? Is there another uh, batch of unused uh, material? material that you didn't put in your book that you could put out for like a Special, special edition? Uh, yeah, I mean, basically, we it was fun. We, I got to interview with, I got to do a, a lot of uh, detective work with the archival person in the film archive. And uh, we found stuff like the Star Wars gag reel and, and things like that. So that was fun. And we, and we found other stuff. And, and one of the things that is just sitting there are, uh, a whole bunch of, uh, I think they're on Betamax at this point, but tapes of filming the, the first Star Wars movie, you know, in, in England and in Tunisia. And there's no, but there's no sound. At some point, the sound got separated from the, from the film. Oh. The 16 millimeter, although it still might be there somewhere in the archives, but they've yet to uncover it. But I've always said, and I tried to sell Lucasfilm on taking that stuff and making a really great documentary, because you could do it. It would just need uh, some, a lot of work. But there's there's definitely stuff in the archives behind yeah. the scenes stuff. 
Yeah, that, that hasn't been seen before. Yeah, so many great audio and video bites in those those ebooks that it made you want to buy them twice, which <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> They're not the, the the digital versions are pretty cheap. That's why we want them twice. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. And JW, we're so interested in what you have to say. Could you just lean forward a little bit? I think you're so far back, the sound was just getting a little buggy. I know you look so comfortable. I don't want to bug <laughs> oh, you, but. Yeah. That, that nice dolly shot. Yeah. I, yeah, just a little closer is perfect. Thank you. Okay. Now, with, with the making of books, I know you started one on The Force Awakens. That's a big controversial topic right there. But can you give us an idea of, how far into the book you got before Disney Lucasfilm pulled the plug? Uh, the, the manuscript was done. I mean, oh. yeah, they pulled the plug. I mean, it's, they basically pulled the plug after I submitted the manuscript. A uh, couple of people, you know, said it was really great, and but then I heard it was canceled. Which, as I, I don't think I heard. We say this before, but I was fully expected it to be canceled because it just, I just knew from working in that regime that it was not the kind of book they're going to want, even though that's what they'd asked for. Uh, <clears throat> and there was nothing, there was nothing revelatory in the book. You guys know everything that already happened. It's just that I put it in one long sort of narrative instead of hearing one day that, you know, there was an accident, Harrison Ford was hurt, or hearing another day that um, the film was delayed or whatever it was. Um, the only thing the book did is put it all in chronological order and, and, and uh, so on. And there were new, I mean, okay. I, did interview, I did interview the actors and things like that. So, I mean, there's quotes and things you haven't probably heard before, but you're not gonna learn much new about it. They just, they just, huh. I don't know why they just decided they didn't want it. I just, I think for posterity, if anything, like get time and perspective on it. Yeah. We may know those stories right then when the news comes out, but like reading it now, five years later, I think that would be really cool. So I, I really wish, really wish we could read that book. Yeah. I wish I, <laughs> I, I, I published it. It just needs, it just needs to be paired up with the images, which we'd already done a lot of anyway. And then they, you know, Flow it all and, together. Somebody'd have to write captions, and then it could be published. And were you you were on the set for the Forest Awakens while writing this, correct? No, no. Mark Vaz was. The, the book would be credited to me and Mark Cotta Vaz. He went to the set, and he he basically wrote the first draft. It's a long story, but then they pulled me in because they wanted me to kind of write more of a beginning, a little bit more here, a little bit there. So it have both of our names on it. But I didn't go to the set at all. I was at Lucasfilm Disney for the whole, you know, making of it from, you know, I was in meetings and so on, right? concept artists. Uh, but anyway, so I was there for the whole thing, but not on set. Okay. There must be some kind of a campaign we can all start. I know. To get this published. I want to read that. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. That would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now, now let's segue into your new book, All Up, which is now available. And your Amazon link is in the chat bar. So anyone going oh, to yes. visit that. Now, this is a historical fiction thriller about the first space age and the high stakes about getting to the moon first. And you put us right in the middle of the drama between the U.S. and the Germans and the Soviets. So can you tell us all about all up and what inspired you to write it sure and your your site or i'm not sure site yeah. connected has, has an excellent book review by eric eric unkenhout uh, on skywalkingtoneverland.com yeah <laughs> and uh which we will explain probably better than i can here uh i always sort of don't never know where to start but basically what, what inspired me was uh you know seeing the the moon off when i was Kid, I was about seven, and uh, that was something you don't forget. And then, kind of being interested in it my whole life, but then going to the museum. There's this great museum uh, about space travel in uh, Huntsville, Alabama. If you're anywhere near there, definitely it's worth the detour because uh, it's just amazing. And the stuff I saw there just kind of uh, blew my mind, I guess you could say. 
so then I just I just started researching the subject and I realized that I knew nothing about the space age and I really didn't know who I sort of you know most people have heard of Werner von Braun and they've heard of Operation Paperclip but the details of the story are just so fascinating that this guy who started out when he was about 20 working on rockets in Germany and basically which only kooks were doing kooks and weird scientists inventor types and ended up basically uh, presenting weapons and rockets to Hitler, but also then to Eisenhower and, and John F. Kennedy. I mean, that's the kind of stuff you can't make up. And so telling his story and then the Russian Soviet, his opposite number story, I just learned a ton and I realized nobody really knows about any of this stuff. And, and, there, and there's certain subjects that you can't tackle in nonfiction. You can do it in fiction, like the sort of ancillary stories about, you know, Foo Fighters and UFOs that they're dealing with and, and you know, assassinations and a lot of violence. <laughs> uh, the, the human species is really uh, a, a interesting and but also very violent species, particularly during the time the book covers, which is World War II and up to the fall of 11. You know, sort of constant conflict of one kind or another. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great history lesson all rolled into into fiction. How much of it is fact versus how much of it is is fiction? Uh, it's really mostly uh, fact based. It's about I'd say ninety percent based on documents. And I mean, I spent seven years basically doing research and. Um, and sort of doing that sort of chronology timeline, even though for a book a fiction, I wanted to get it as right as possible and get all the technical stuff as right as possible. And there's, uh, I had people, you know, English people read it, German people read it to make sure that the German parts and English parts sounded right to them. Uh, and and, and uh, some of the Russian language parts as well. But anyway, yeah, so it's, I really tried to make it real. And the stuff that some people will say, well, that's not, you know, like the Battle of Los Angeles, is still based on real documentation that's just not accepted into the official canon. So there's maybe another five percent, and then there's maybe then there's another five percent that's pure, you know, fanciful, fun stuff to just make the the novel more interesting and, and more entertaining. Because above all, it is entertainment. Yeah. And yeah. Really yeah. I did get a chance to read a, a little bit and. It, it gave me the i it, it kind of had a indiana jones the, the young indiana jones chronicle feel about it where you have these real life events with a fictional story wrapped around it was that yeah. that's something that was in your mind sort yeah although in this case the fictional story is, is hewing pretty close to what actually happened you know, there's there's little some, some things that i'm making up dialogue i'm making up but the basic story of the V2 rocket and how MI6 in England was trying to figure out what the Nazis are doing and this whole cat and mouse thing and huge bombing raids and and land battles as they tried to as the, everybody's trying to get these scientists at the end uh, to take them back to their country forcibly uh, more or less so um, yeah it's uh, it's it's basically the Somewhat like Young Indiana Jones. If you were to make it into a TV show, it would be perfect. And yeah. the, whole, the whole thing is meant to be episodic TV. Right. Cool. Yeah, it had a Young Indiana Jones feel and a little bit of Rogue One, where it wore the Operation Paperclip, where if anyone doesn't know, that's when German scientists and engineers were brought over to the United States to work on our rockets. So I kind of got the Jin Erso feel Oh. feel from that <laughs> and how some like the galen urso galen urso yeah, yeah. Say Jen? I'm yeah sorry. No, Jen. no worries <laughs> we'll, we'll edit that part out <laughs> yeah the galen urso galen feel. urso how we they were forced to work on uh you for forced to work on the death star where these nazis the whole, some of these these german scientists who, who were later found out they were they were nazis had to work on our uh space race yeah i mean they they wanted to do it it's just that, um, that, that there were definitely the ones who want, came to the United States, they really wanted to come uh, 
the ones who got, there were a whole other group that was taken to, to Russia, Soviet Russia, they did not want to go. <laughs> and so it's interesting to see also how the Soviet Union kind of used their Germans and how we ended up using our Germans, so to speak. Right. Okay. Now there was a part in the book where a British pilot used his, his fighter to knock a V-1 rocket off course. Did that really happen, or once again, am I looking too much into Rogue One here? No, that that was like I, when I read about the several books that involved the attack, the V one attack on London. Yeah, one of the things they were able to do, the British pilots, is is they were able to fly faster than the V one, which had wings, and and tip them over, basically disrupt their gyro system so it would go crashing down to the surface, which they would do if it had a better chance of you know, landing on farmland rather than landing in the city, which is where they were heading. So yeah, okay. no, that was based on that. It was really, as our, as all, all the sort of huge action scenes are, or little action scenes are based on fact. Okay. Yeah, because that part in Rogue One where the hammerhead blockade runner hits into the Star Destroyer. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm getting a feeling that JW really likes to research. <laughs> <laughs> I like your research. I, I, like, uh, I'd like to write a sequel to All Up. Ooh. I oh. A lot of research, but I wish, I hope that I get to do it. That's exciting. And I do have to call out Bryn in the chat who just donated some V-Coin to Make-A-Wish. Thank oh, you, Bryn. Woo. Thank you. Thank you, Bryn. <laughs> in the book, you described a very horrific scene as prisoners and workers are mass executed by, by a machine gun in the woods. Was that, was that part, you did it in such, such detail. Was that part, did you research that? Or was that from your, your own imagination about all the detail that went into that? Because that was, that was pretty like horrific. Uh, well, it's the kind of thing, unfortunately, that happened right. frequently under the Third Reich. But yeah, mm -hmm. that part, the, 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 the parts about the, the SS sort of secret weapons, that is based on, you know, books, that are based on documents that have seem to be real, but it still falls into the more of the speculative uh, history part. Although there's a couple of very serious books by serious journal journalists about it, but not accepted as genuine history by history books at this point. But yeah, there and if if it took place, there's evidence that the SS then executed the there. In this case, it was the scientists who were working on the program and oh. the, the in charge. Is this, is this very notorious SS commander named Hans Kammler. And he's based on a real historical personage and actually fairly close to what we know about him uh, officially. He, he's a very scary character. Mm. Huh. Yeah, I, I was kind of hoping these were taken from actual documents then, <laughs> then what, what you could conjure up in your own imagination. Oh. Like, oh. You were worried about his. I was, I was worried about your well-being. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should worry about that, regardless. <laughs> <laughs> now, you also mentioned the 500 series, which makes up the Saturn V. In one instance, you say that one part is the 501st part. Is that a, yeah. a Star Wars Easter egg? No, that's. I think that you have to ask the 501st whether they didn't name themselves after that specific rocket. Sorry. Oh. My family's next door. Are they making too much noise? We can't hear them yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, we can have them. Uh, yeah, just you to say something. Yeah, sure. ask him to hold on for another <laughs> Thank thirty-one you. minutes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> <That was> sweet. <laughs> so everyone, so uh, we're gonna get to some of your comments in just a, a few seconds. Yeah. I know uh, uh, WR, you had a comment here. But we had already gone to the all up portion. But we'll yeah, get back to yeah, that. We, we see that. Circle back. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought this, so. This isn't live streaming. It is. It is. Yes. Oh, it is. Yes. Oh. <laughs> You're live. Very exciting. <laughs> and your family's live too. <laughs> okay. Well, this is what happens in live. Uh, yeah. Pe people expect yeah. it. People expect it. It's all good. <laughs> now you, you've done so much uh, research on the space race. When someone says that the 1969 oh. moon landing was a farce, well, what would you turn around and say to them? I'd say there's. <laughs> It's, that's not possible. <laughs> you, you have to do, you you know, if you if you spend a lot of time researching it, I mean, it, it's I don't just don't see how it's possible to to fake it and uh, 
And I think that I saw a really great YouTube video once where somebody pointed out how it was because of the technology that we know they were using, it was impossible for them to fake the video transmission coming from the moon. Huh. <laughs> like at that time, it was impossible. At that time, it was, yeah. There was, technologically, it was impossible. And I can't repeat exactly what why, but this was seemed to know what he was talking about. But anyway. Uh, I mean, it's yeah. YouTube, so of course they know. <laughs> yeah. <And> that, <laughs> Actually, I, I asked John Knoll once, the visual effects supervisor for episodes one, two, and three, and he's a big, he like knows everything about the Apollo 11 mission and all that stuff. And I asked him what he would say, and he said, if, if you know, he say it's a, a farce or whatever, he would say, you know, and then you're, you're basically dishonoring all the work that these thousands and thousands of people did. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure where the basis of that comes from or why people think it's it's a, a made-up story. I think because of special effects. It was maybe shot on a soundstage at Warner Brothers. But yeah. Well, yeah, the student Stanley Kubrick has something to do with it. But, it, but I, um, yeah, I just, there was another guy. Oh, that's, that's another story. Anyway, you can, <laughs> oh, you can edit this out. Okay, so I stopped mumbling. Next. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Let, let's now talk about UFOs because there's a lot of bits about UFO sightings by pilots. What are your thoughts on on UFOs, fact or fiction? Uh, you know, I somebody asked me this the other day because they were I sort of defending the UFOs in the book, and uh, I just so I just did a quick search on the internet, and the first thing that came up is that a British, the first British woman astronaut, uh, said in a recent interview or a couple of years ago that yeah she said aliens are real absolutely that's the end of the story uh so that's an astronaut saying that oh I, I, and and uh, there's been a number of astronauts that have said they have seen ufos or something very odd and uh um, and tons of professional pilots and military pilots and commercial airlines if you do the research there's just it's not, it, there's just thousands and thousands of sightings. Uh, I find there's a, and that's just one part of the evidence. You know, there's so much evidence if you actually do the research, I'd say without a doubt. Just, yeah, and even the Pentagon has released stuff recently that sort of flew under the radar on the New York Times. You know, actually, the Pentagon is actually releasing footage of people sighting. They're not calling them UFOs anymore, I forget. They have a, different word for it, different acronym but it's basically ufos hmm. yeah every night i tell sarah I'm, I'm seeing ufos outside but then she's reminding me that it's a street light and <laughs> the day goes on yeah I haven't, I haven't seen one myself but uh no no i've seen a lot of things that are uh unidentified in los angeles but <laughs> i'm not, not sure if i would call them space aliens has anyone in the chat seen ufos please let <laughs> us know yeah <laughs> All right, uh, now I wanna talk about your upcoming work, and this is the memoir on Howard Gazanjian. And I, I'm so interested with this because I think he's just a, a phenomenal producer. We don't really hear that much about him, and he was the producer of Return of the Jedi and Raiders of the Lost Ark. So can you tell us what, what this book, uh, how you started it, did he come to you, did you go to him? Uh, we have... Um... I, I'd met Howard a couple of times before because of the Return of the Jedi book, but it was a, we have a mutual friend named Brandon Allinger who uh, also runs the prop store down south. And uh, I think Howard wanted to sort of get his life work on paper and Brandon thought it would be more interesting if I interviewed him and made, and actually we ended up interviewing him. Uh, and then sort of, I wrote a book about Howard, but in his, you know, in his voice, a good deal of the time. So it's like his memoirs written by me. But then I also interviewed, you know, about I don't know, a dozen other people for the book. So it's yeah, it's, but it's still basically about his career, which is which is fascinating. And I, he's had a really quite amazing career. Awesome. Yeah, and I haven't really read that much about Howard Kazanjian. So when I when I saw that you were working on that, I thought, oh, oh. Oh, you got to dig into this. Now, is yeah. is there, how much does he go into the fact that he was brought in by George Lucas during the production of The Empire Strikes Back when the film was going over budget and over schedule? How much of that does, does he reveal? 
uh, I mean, he tells the he tells the whole story. You know, he start he started working at Lucasfilm in 1977, just a few months before Star Wars came out. So, I mean, I don't want to spoil do any spoilers for the book, but basically, I think there's a I think there are a few things that have never maybe been quite said so explicitly as in as in this book. Oh. In terms of what happened on Empire, and then um, and then of course you know it, his career is interesting because he was for a while he was like the best first assistant director in the business. And if you don't know what a first assistant director is, he's basically the, the person who runs the set. You know, the yeah. director, the actors, or there's the set has all ton different things that are happening, and the first assistant director is, is responsible for all that. And so Kazanjian did that, and he worked with the. Uh, Sam Peckinpah on The Wild Bunch, you know, that mm -hmm. seminal western, and worked on Hitchcock with Alfred Hitchcock's last film. So just, you know, and then later he works with Clint Eastwood. So, and it's a different, so it's very interesting and, and he has an interesting point of view, so. Yeah, I, I remember reading some of that in Alan Arnold's Making of Empire book. And I was just so, always so fascinated to hear more about it just because there's, I know there's a lot of, of backstory there and putting on a movie like The Empire Strikes Back is you're spinning a ton of plates at the same time. So just to hear in his own words, in his own words, how that came, how that came about, I'm just so interested in. Now, do, do you have a knack for pulling information from people that they wouldn't normally reveal to someone else? Uh, I don't know. I. I, I like to think that I'm a pretty good interviewer, but I know that I know you're not supposed to. I, you know, some people just have their they just go down their list. I, of course, you want to never do that. You always want to follow the interviewee and their their line trail of thought if you can, or if it's interesting. But uh, I've had a couple interviews. I think where yeah, sometimes you just get along really well with the person and things just really flow, and those are those are really fun. Nice. Well, speaking of, I know you spoke with Marsha Lucas for the memoir, and I'm so excited about this. She doesn't do a lot of interviews, and I know you said no spoilers, but can you give us maybe a tidbit on just like one thing she said? On Marsha well, Lucas. I can tell you the kind of things she talks about. Okay. And it, was, it was great. It was really great to interview Marsha Lucas. It, I think it was one of those kind of interviews where she was really enjoying it and because she doesn't really do it that often but because she was such good friends with howard and carol his wife she consented to you know to be interviewed and, and uh, to write the foreword for the book wow so yes yeah, she, she you know she talks about editing star wars you know she was very key in that process and uh and she talks about first meeting george lucas so uh there's definitely stuff in there that I think fans will be interested in um, to come out of, that came out of her interview. She says what she thinks of the Star Wars sequels. Oh, and so that's definitely interesting. <laughs> I think people will find that interesting. Yeah. Cool. Can you, can you give us a small hint? No, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> You're dangling that can, carrot. Can you give us a big hint then? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> no, she was pretty. She was pretty candid. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's right. that's a good tease. Okay. All right. I like it. Once once again, that's 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 something else. I think we'll get people to line up at Barnes and Noble. Are there still Barnes and Nobles anymore? Or I don't know. Amazon <laughs> online. Yeah. Yeah. Just get stores out there. Luck, thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> I'm see. I'm glad because that was that was, it was so much fun going to a bookstore and just smelling the books and just getting out there and, and remembering that people used to go to bookstores and say, hey, what are you reading? What are you reading? I've mm -hmm. had so many friends in bookstores before. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. Let's, let's read a comment from okay. W.R. Miller. He writes, does Howard Kazanjian talk about changing Revenge of the Jedi to Return of the Jedi or that Vengeance of Khan to Wrath of Khan situation? Uh, he does mention the title change, yeah. He'll, he'll, he tells that story. Can you give us a little hint about what he said there, or still we gotta wait until uh, Barnes and Nobles opens? <laughs> I feel you know, it's funny because I think the, sto the story is also in the making of Return of the Jedi. Uh, the, the first part of the story is that uh, George was going to call it Return of the Jedi. That was going to be the original title. 
and oh. Howard said, Howard, yeah, it was always going to be Return of the Jedi. Uh, but then uh, Howard said, Return is kind of weak. There had been a couple returns not that at that time, and they hadn't done well at the box office. So then George said, all right, well, like a day later, he said, I'm going to change it to Revenge of the Jedi. And so that's the way it was for a while. I'm wondering if he's thinking about Return to Which Mountain? Or some, no, uh, don't know. I don't think what, so. No. Uh, <laughs> so is is there a target release date for the Howard Kazanjian memoir? And is there a, an official title? Um, I think the official title is something like Howard Kazanjian: A Producer's Life, working with Hitchcock, Spielberg, Peckinpah, Billy Wilder, sort of the list of names. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the target date is uh, the last I heard was. April of next year, so April 2021. Okay, and Chase has just put the Amazon pre-order link in the chat. It's called Howard Kazanjian, A Producer's Life. <laughs> well, Thanks, Chase. Title, right? Yeah. <laughs> they have a different title, so I, the new title is recent. So. Well, if it's a Howard Kazanjian book, chances are the name will change three or four more times. Mm. Revenge of Howard Kazanjian? <laughs> Return to Howard Kazanjian. <laughs> Maybe we should change the name of this panel. <laughs> and change it to Blue Harvest. Leave it at that. <laughs> now, what, what books do you read on your spare time when you're not writing? What books do you read? Uh, I like to read his, history books. I do like, uh, I find it fascinating. I, I recently read a, a big one on Napoleon. It covered his whole life and career. So uh, that, that was fun. Nice. What do you consider to be your greatest professional accomplishment? Uh, I think maybe it's just surviving at Lucasfilm for 15 years. <laughs> you know, <laughs> having, having a pretty good run there uh, overall. I mean, there were so many great experiences, just, you know, in the totality of it. But uh, it was definitely a highlight of my life. Awesome. Yeah. Is there one specific piece, whether it being a Clone Wars episode or one of your books, a Star Wars book or another making of books? When people talk about J.W. Rinsler. What's the one thing that you want to come to their mind? Uh, entertainment. <laughs> you know, a good read that they, that, you know, oh, that guy writes a book, but that's fun to read. That would be nice. Okay. All right. And you mentioned some of the other books because I want everyone to know how. how these are just the books that you've written, not were an editor on, but you've written. There were the, the Star Wars comic, which num went to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Woohoo! It was making of the Star Wars Empire and Jedi and Revenge of the Sith, Sounds of Star Wars, Star oh, Wars Blueprints, which is a really fun book, uh, Star Wars Storyboards, The Art of Revenge of the Sith, and then we have the making of the Indiana Jones saga, making of Planet of the Apes, oh. making of Aliens. Make a million. So, well, when do you sleep? <laughs> uh, um, well, uh, I try and get a good night's sleep. I think I um, was lucky in that they just was able to. Most writers have to wait, you know, six months or two years between a book. I, for some reason, it just without planning it, all of these books dovetailed really well at Lucasfilm. And, uh, and then uh, when I and when I went freelance, also each book dovetailed right into the other. It was a really good run. Now I really thought you're you would have answered by saying your own Tron legacy action figure. Because uh, <laughs> yeah, the legs of it back there. Oh yeah, because the oh. the villain from Tron Legacy is named Rinsler. Sweet. Yeah, so somebody when I was at Lucasfilm. Because we worked with this company who did that. Somehow I got a, they sent me one, which was nice. That's so cool. Did they talk to you beforehand or they just named the villain Rinsler and say, look at this? They just named the villain Rinsler. And people started <laughs> asking me why is there's this character before the movie came out named Rinsler. <laughs> that there were always directors and stuff coming through doing Q and A's at Lucasfilm. So one of the guys who was, was the guy who directed the movie. Uh, Joe, Joe Kaczynski, I think, is his name. And so I just asked him after his Q&A, I said, why, uh, why Rinsler? He said, oh, these guys had the Making a Star Wars book on the table. And they said, oh, let's name him Rinsler. Because <laughs> uh, one day he came in and you yelled at him. 
So he's got, a, he's got his just desserts. There you go. Well, I, I guess the writers decided, and I guess the director was fine with it. <laughs> nothing to do with me except my name. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> do, right. do you have the actual Rinsler action figure? The three and three quarter what? inch? No, the three quarter inch. I, I think I do somewhere. I think I went to Toys R Us and got it. <laughs> <laughs> is is that is that a maquette right behind you up there? I mean, Which one? The, the one, one over your showed? left shoulder. You were pointing at. Yeah, the, right. The, the yeah. one it is. Oh, there you go. Yeah. 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 So cool. The other shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see him. <laughs> Aww. There you go. So there you go. Yeah. You have a representation there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Now, is is there a making of book you've always wanted to write? Of any, like saga. Or film. Yeah. I, w I would like to write one day a uh, making of North by Northwest, the uh, Alfred Hitchcock movie. So yeah. Just, that would be so visually spectacular, assuming that I could find assets. And, I, and there's never been a really great, deluxe, high-end book on Hitchcock. A hit, single Hitchcock film, so I, I'd love to do that. Is this something that you would almost do as a pet project on spec, and hopefully someone would go, "Hey, this is the book we've been looking for." If I could afford to, yeah. <laughs> you know, like over over the years, you just do you, have you collected information about North by Northwest and put it in a in a folder, hoping to someday use it? No, I haven't. I haven't been that diligent. No. Okay. Okay. Now we have some chat questions here. I know John Liang is asking, what is your favorite history book? Maybe you have a recommendation for all of us who want to get into historical books like you. Uh, I, I guess, boy, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. um, offhand, uh, a people's history of the United States is, is pretty interesting. It's pretty eye-opening. Cool. Okay. All right. Eric Unkenhout just, just popped in here. Hey, Eric. Eric just put up his... All up review on skywalkingtoneverland.com. Good to see you, Eric. Oh, yeah. All right. There's another one. Uh, oh. uh, W.R. Miller wants us to know that there is a Barnes & Noble in Burbank. And will you come for a book tour? Oh. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm doing a lot of them these days, but uh, I would certainly go once everything is safe to do so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not much going on right now. All right. I'm very excited. There was another... Uh, yeah. Another one here. Where did it go? Yeah. Uh, here we go. Oh. W.R. Miller asks, did you get to read George's treatments for the sequels pre-Disney? If so, what are the differences with what George had in mind versus what Disney actually made? Wow. That's a question. Yeah. <laughs> I've been asked that. I, I don't think I can say because it violates my NDA. Oh, but you know. I, I can either... Deny or, <laughs> or deny. If, if you read the treatment that had to do with midichlorians, blink twice. <laughs> oh, man, he's good. He's good. <laughs> now, what, what advice would you give up-and-coming writers? There's a lot of writers in our group, in our chats, and I know they want to ask you that, that same thing. Uh, well, I, I, God, uh, I guess the advice I would give is to if you're really going to be want to write as a career is to just get a job if you can that somehow has you write so that you're writing all the time or editing all the time because it's really just the more you do it the better you get and um, then you learn things and, and so on and um, but uh, and also don't let people tell you that you know, don't get discouraged easily if you can't sell your work the first time because it's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> yeah, very That's much true. so. <laughs> Should we open up the, the questions, the comments? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah? Yeah. All right. You know what? We're going to open it up if someone wants to grab a spot and so, maybe come on and Eric ask Unkenhout a question. Eric Unkenhout and John Liang. John Liang is a historian. And here he is. There's John. Oh, sir. Um, how long did it take to write the Star Wars Blueprints book? Uh, what 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 went into doing that? Pardon the cat. Uh, the Blueprints book was done had to be done really fast. I'd been pitching it to various publishers over the years, and finally uh, Becker and Mayer said they would do it. Um, Ola Chronicle distributed it, and then it had to be done really fast. 
Um, and but fortunately, all all the pieces came together, um, and I was able again. Sometimes things just dovetail. I was just able to talk to all these production people uh, in about eight weeks, and uh, I don't remember exactly, but it, it had to be done very quickly. And uh, in fact, and there was so much pressure, I got pneumonia at the time. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> bad, John. Worked, bad. Sorry. <laughs> I, worked, I worked through it because I had to hit that deadline. And then it, it was beautifully designed, so I really liked that. It was part. very beautiful. Then, well, thank you. Yeah, there was a special edition version. Thank you. <laughs> I'm only kidding, John. Come I back. Know. If I'm anyone sorry. else wants to grab a spot and ask a question, you totally can. All Yay. right. And this is very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? What's I know you've so you've wrapped the Howard Kazanjian book. Is that correct? Are you? Yeah, I just sent the uh, edited. They edited it, and I, you know, go through and. Do their edits or whatever. Uh, I just sent that version back. So yeah, the manuscript is pretty much done at this point. So, so is there anything you're working on next that you can kind of tease us with? All up to? <laughs> uh, not really. I not I, nothing I can reveal. Ooh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. There you go. Now, for for the Howard Kazanjian, uh, the interviews you did with him, how many times did you have to go in and see him? Was it one just one large? long interview or did you go home and transcribe some th some things and, and think wait a minute this wasn't that clear let me go back to him and ask him some more questions how many how many interview sessions does it take to do a memoir like this well i don't know if, you know every book is different i did a rick baker book before this uh where i think i talked i don't know if it's about the same but anyway it's different for each for for howard and, and this is, I think, what most people probably do is, you, yeah, you do a bunch of interviews. I think we did two or three days of interviews, maybe four. Um, and then I wrote the manuscript, and and uh, Howard read it. And then there were all these questions because you had to fill in clear gaps in the manuscript. And that was another, I think, another almost two days of interviews. So, you know, quite a few hours. Do you have to go home and transcribe everything to realize what things that you've missed, or do you make mental notes? Uh, but we had a professional transcriber. Okay. Right. Okay. With the transcribing, it takes forever. It just takes too long. Yeah, yeah. I'm just always so very curious about that process when you see uh, different different stages of interviews. You know, what at what point do you have to go back and and fill in Catalog. some of those gaps? Yeah. Or make things more clear. And yeah. and with with Marsha Lucas, how many times did, had you spoken to her? Marsha Lucas was just one solid afternoon. Oh, nice. Okay, was there any other Star Wars alumni going to be featured in this book? Uh, well, I definitely talked to a few alumni. You know, they're they're supporting characters, if, if you will. <laughs> um, but I talked to Ben Burt, and I talked to uh, Jane Bay. You know, George's longtime mm -hmm. executive. Assistant. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked to Randall Kleiser, the director of Greece. Yeah, they were all sort of uh, they were classmates at USC, and uh, George Lucas and Randall Kleiser roomed together. They were roommates, so it was, uh, and you know, and some other very interesting people too. So there's a, there's a, it, the book is it should be interesting to anybody who likes films, and definitely people who are Star Wars people. And just want some extra info. Well, I think we'll also find it interesting. Oh, That's good fantastic. to know. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Let's let's about wrap this up here. So before we do wrap up, do you want to give people your your social media handles where they can find you on social media? Sure. I, I, I'm a, I have a website, jwrinsler.com, and I'm on Twitter at jwrinsler. And I, I don't go on social media that much, but but you can find me there. You've made it easy for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Not the official J.W. Rinsler or the or the one and only. Yeah, we don't have. I don't think we have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so we'll go ahead and put your Amazon link in the chat one more time and remind everyone to please go over there to Make a Wish and and donate, 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 and hit the little V up in the upper right hand corner, the the blue V. Yeah. Every time you donate. Get vocal throws a little bit more into the pot with you. 
Yeah. All right, JW, thank you so much for taking out the time. Loved every minute of it. You answered so many questions that I had, and thank you so much for providing a copy of All Up. And uh, I'm hearing such fantastic things about it from Eric and other people who have who have read it. That's great. Yeah, please spread the word. And, and yeah, thanks again for inviting me. Oh, fun. our pleasure. All You're right. welcome. May the Force Fest be with you. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> and right. you can stop the broadcast now. Yeah. Chase.